Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to see you all uh, this evening. As has uh, been said, I'm, I'm Julian Crampton, Vice Chancellor University of Brighton. It really is a great pleasure to welcome you to the university uh, this evening on the occasion uh, of David Taylor's uh, inaugural lecture as Professor of Social Theory and Social Policy at the University of Brighton. Uh, inaugural lectures uh, are very special occasions at the university calendar. Uh, and uh, before I invite David to talk, to us this evening, I'd really like to give you a little background on David's career. He started his undergraduate uh, studies at the University of Bath, graduating in 1974 with a degree in sociology. Uh, subsequently, David continued his studies at the University of Manchester, where he obtained his MA in politics in 1975. Immediately after graduating, he was appointed as a lecturer in sociology at what is now the University of Central Lecture, teaching the sociology of art and literature and open organisational sociology. David moved to London in 1977 to undertake further postgraduate study at the LSE, and he was also appointed as an associate lecturer at what is now at London Metropolitan University. And subsequently, he was appointed as a full-time lecturer, promoted to senior lecturer, then principal lecturer, with a number of really quite important academic leadership roles. And in 1998, David was appointed as the first head of the newly created School of Applied Social Science at the University of Brighton and was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Health and Social Science in 2007. David was awarded the title of Professor in 2009. Now since moving to Brighton, David has done a really a fantastic job, I think, much to promote and provide academic leadership for the School of Applied Social Science and more recently his faculty. And in a moment we'll hear more about his research on welfare and well-being. However, David has also published and been very influential in his exploration of the relationship between the individual and the social, in sociology and social policy, through the development of analytical frameworks for understanding citizenship and social identity, and applying psychosocial analyses to policy evaluation. Importantly, David has been a very strong advocate for the social sciences, critically engaging wider audiences. And just one example of this is his pivotal role and long-standing contribution the development of the journal Critical uh, Social Policy, having joined the editorial collective in the 1980s and having been its production editor for nine years. David is both an outstanding academic leader and an innovative researcher and scholar, an example of that these two important roles can still be combined. And we are all looking forward to hearing what he has to say tonight as I now invite him to deliver his inaugural lecture entitled Welfare and Wellbeing in an Age of Responsibility. David, over to you. Well, thank you, Vice-Chancellor, and thank you, colleagues, distinguished guests, and especially my friends and family for being here tonight. I'd also like to thank the events team at the University for their work in organising tonight's event. Lastly, I must, of course, thank the University Professorial Committee for honouring me with this title. The committee might not have been aware, however, that this is the second time a professorial title has been bestowed upon me. The first was some 35 years ago, when I was, in fact, just starting my academic career as a postgraduate student at the London School of Economics. My friend Simon and I, who I'm pleased to say is here tonight, decided to spend one summer tracing the Nile from its mouth in Alexandria to its source in Burundi. About two to three weeks into that journey, we found ourselves in Upper Egypt, travelling between Luxor and Aswan on a third-class ticket on a train, along with goats, chickens, and what seemed like about a thousand other passengers. It was midsummer. I've no idea why we chose to go in July and August, and it was about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We decided to spend most of the journey sitting on the roof of the train, um, occasionally ducking to miss the telegraph poles as they crossed the tracks, um, and we got very hot and dehydrated. We turned to the only source of liquid that we had at that time, which was an unopened bottle of whiskey. <laughs> we managed to finish it off. The last thing I remember was being back inside the carriage, advancing down it, and falling flat on my face in a semi-comatose state. 
As we arrived in Aswan, Simon thought that I required medical attention and summoned the only available transport at that time, a horse and cart or Egyptian kalesh. Thinking that it would expedite matters, I think, Simon said to the driver, quick, this man needs medical attention. He's a very important professor from a London university. <laughs> I think the Kalesh driver looked at Simon and then looked at me and said, but sir, he's drunk. <laughs> Simon replied, don't worry, they're all like that. <laughs> well, I survived and we made it on to Burundi. But tonight I want to talk about something far more sober. How the application of social theory to the study of social policy can help us understand contemporary debates about welfare and well-being. Along the way, I hope to show a little of how I've contributed to these debates through my own work. And I want to start with a consideration of the recent politics of well-being and happiness. Anyone interested in public policy cannot have failed to notice the growing prominence given to the ideas of well-being and happiness in recent years. Just over 40 years ago now, American Senator Robert Kennedy famously pointed out that economic growth on its own does not tell us anything about individual well-being, or, to use his words, that which makes life worthwhile. Kennedy used an example. A rapid growth in the crime rate leads to increases in the purchases of burglar alarms. This contributes to economic growth, but it is hardly an indicator of increased well-being. Others have used the example of traffic jams, which cause increased petrol consumption, which leads in turn to a growth of GDP, but of course has a negative impact on both the environment and individual well-being. Not all economic growth is good for us or improves our well-being. Within the social sciences, the economist Robert Easterlin has shown that over the last 35 years, in affluent countries, and I'm talking here of only affluent countries, there's been a widening gap between average GDP per head and measurements of happiness. Despite continued economic growth, life satisfaction remains stubbornly flat. This has become known as the Easterlin paradox. Increases in national wealth beyond a certain point do not lead to increased uh, in reported individual well-being. American economists Daniel Kahneman and Angus Dayton suggest that a high level of income doesn't necessarily make much of a difference either, at least for moment-to-moment -moment happiness. According to their recent work, income over about $75,000 per annum does nothing to improve how much Americans enjoy their activities or how happy they are on a typical day. In 2008, Recognising the limits of GDP as a measure, French President Nicolas Sarkozy commissioned Jean-Paul Fetoussi, Joseph Stiglitz and Amartya Sen to consider better ways of measuring economic performance and societal progress. In 2009, their commission concluded that governments should shift emphasis from measuring economic production to measuring people's well-being. In the UK, the last parliament, inspired by the work of happiness economist LSE professor Lord Richard Layard of IAPT fame established an all-party parliamentary group on well-being economics. This aimed to challenge GDP as the government's main indicator of national success. And for some time now, the UK think tank the New Economics Foundation has lobbied for the replacement of gross domestic product with a national account of well-being. A situation, incidentally, which has existed in the small Buddhist state of Bhutan since 1972, which measures only GNH, gross national happiness. So, when Prime Minister David Cameron announced that following a public consultation by the Office of National Statistics, we in the UK will soon have a new national happiness index, and more recently, that all new social and public policy would have to pass a happiness test, should we not be pleased that politicians are looking for a better understanding of social progress and human well-being than simple economic growth. Well, political debate about what constitutes human well-being is indeed to be welcomed, and certainly something which social theory and social policy should contribute to. However, I want to argue tonight that current debates are starting from a false premise, 
that human well-being equates in any substantial way to self-reported happiness. Despite the fact that we all want, no doubt, to be happy, I would suggest that individual happiness is not a good enough aim for social and public policy. It's both too naively ambitious, the idea that we can or should be happy all of the time, and far too limited to think that human well-being can be reduced to happiness. Public policy for human well-being should be about far more than a single transient emotion. And one of the things I want to do tonight is to suggest ways in which the social sciences can give us a deeper understanding of well-being than that found in the recent politics and economics of happiness. So what do we already know about well-being? We know from several studies that in affluent societies, it is the distribution of wealth rather than its total accumulation as measured by GDP that impacts most on individual and social well-being. As Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett have powerfully shown in the spirit level why more equal societies always, almost always do better, more equal rich societies typically have higher levels of education, more trust and community involvement, greater social mobility, uh, more well-being amongst children, lower levels of physical and mental ill health, less drug abuse, lower rates of imprisonment, etc. The list goes on. Societies with a bigger gap between rich and poor, they argue, are bad for everyone in them, including the well-off. Whilst greater equality yields the greatest benefits for the poor, benefits extend to the majority of the population. This is also a central theme in Sir Michael Marmot's recent report to the last UK Secretary of State for Health, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. Marmot confirmed that social inequalities lead to health inequalities and what has been called a social gradient in health. The lower a person's social position, the worse his or her health. Marmot called for a fair distribution of health, well-being and sustainability, with particular attention to how to address social and health inequalities at every stage of the life course. In short, then, greater inequality makes us all ill, and greater equality has the potential to make us better. Yet there is little evidence, especially in recent years, of governments pursuing equality as an aim of public policy. However, the issue is not quite as simple as that. Greater economic equality on its own is not a panacea for poor health and well-being, or, put another way, is not a sufficient cause of improved health and well-being. So economic growth per se will not do, and inequality is very definitely a central part of the story, but only part. So we need to consider how contemporary and social and public policy might better address social and individual well-being. Well, in order to do this, I want to set the issue in its wider context and examine some of the assumptions which frame recent political debates. At the same time as the idea of well-being has been gaining ground politically, we have seen a weakening of political commitment to the related idea of welfare and to the institutions of the welfare state as a positive social good. In fact, I would suggest it seems almost odd in today's political climate to see the welfare state as a positive good at all. Yet, in 1950, the British sociologist T.H. Marshall, in his famous essay, Citizenship and Social Class, saw the welfare state as the guarantor of citizenship. For Marshall, it represented the final evolution of the rights of citizenship for the working class. For him, the 18th century brought civil rights, the 19th political rights, and the 20th century what he called social rights. The guarantees of the welfare state finally offered the possibility of the working classes fully achieving civil and political rights by acquiring social rights through welfare. Now, Marshall's account was fundamentally flawed, not least his naive view of the historical evolution and expansion of rights for citizens. And of course, we must also observe the failure of the post-war welfare state to facilitate the social rights of women and racialized and marginalized groups in the ways he implied. His views have been roundly and rightly criticized by feminists and others. But my key point here is this, 
Marshall's views were very influential and typical within mainstream post-war political thought. So much so that it was not at all unusual until relatively recently to advance a view of social progress based upon the guarantees of the welfare state. Professor Bill Jordan, in his recent book, Wellbeing and Welfare, Social Value in Public Policy, points out that for most of the 20th century, the terms welfare and well-being were used more or less synonymously in discussions about human development, social justice and public policy. However, more recently, these two ideas have been ideologically framed as distinct and to some extent opposed. So whilst well-being is enjoying something of a renaissance, Welfare enjoys very few positive connotations today. Why? Since the late 1970s and early 1980s, first new right neoliberal and then social democratic third way thought, argued that the services and benefits of the welfare state create, amongst many other alleged evils, a dependency culture, a lack of individual motivation and self-sufficiency. From this perspective, the welfare state is a costly disincentive to work and a drain on the taxpayer. In announcing the coalition government's planned welfare reform programme, David Cameron suggested that the government reforms would slash 5.5 billion off the welfare bill over the next five years. But reform is thought necessary not only in financial terms, but because, and I quote, the benefit system has created a benefit culture. And it doesn't just allow people to act irresponsibly, but often actively encourages them to do so. Now, whether or not this is the case, I find it fascinating how political ideology understands disincentives for different groups. As you may know, the new plan includes a guarantee that for every extra one pound earned, claimants will keep 35p. Whilst in some ways this is very much to be welcomed, I do find it revealing that a marginal tax rate of 65%, the rate at which benefits are withdrawn for the poor, is considered adequate to incentivise the poor back to work. Whereas a top tax rate of 50% is so often challenged by the rich as a disincentive to work. A view endorsed, of course, by Chancellor Osborne in his recent budget when he indicated his intention to scrap the top rate. Claimants, then, are told to stop acting irresponsibly and get themselves ready for work through various self-improvement programmes. Those who are thought to abuse the system by not taking work offered will lose their benefits. Under the government's new proposals, there will be three key offences. Refusing a job, failing to apply for a position when told to do so by a job seeker advisor, or simply failing to turn up for a placement interview. Hence, we've seen the growth of what is referred to as conditionality, as well as various forms of labour activation policy designed to get claimants off benefits. Conditionality is by no means new, but as Professor Ruth Lister has pointed out, over the past three decades, the conditions attached to receipt receipt of benefit have been intensified, and the sanctions for non-compliance increased, and conditionality has been extended to other groups of benefit recipients, notably lone parents, partners, and disabled people. Now, the problem of labour activation policies is that they are based on a supply-side model of deficit amongst claimants, and they simply do not address structural problems in the labour market, or put very simply, the lack of available decent jobs. Activation without job creation is only half a welfare settlement. Such views are, of course, also based on a view that social inclusion is best secured through work. There is indeed abundant evidence that work is a major factor in human well-being in advanced societies. But useful occupation, which leads to personal well-being, can take many other forms. If we focus only on paid work in the formal economy, we neglect the importance of political... Sorry, we we neglect the importance of non-work activities such as care to the economy... Incidentally, this is one of the most enduring political ironies, since according to calculations by Carers UK and Buckner and Yindel at the University of Leeds, we know that unpaid care saves the government an estimated £87 billion per year in potential welfare costs, a figure, incidentally, which is about the same as the total annual cost of the NHS. 
Around 6 million people, as returned in the 2001 census, provide unpaid care to a family member, friend or neighbour. And this includes over 1.2 million people providing over 50 hours per week in formal care. This figure is certainly an underestimate, as it will not include all children who provide care for dependent adults. Incidentally, 2,000 children under the age of 18, for example, are estimated to be caring for an adult with physical or mental health needs in Brighton and Hove, and some of those are as young as six. But welfare has become workfare, and the welfare state has, has come to be seen as something which locks work-shy claimants into dependency on the state. The role of government is to activate claimants to take control of their own circumstances and their own well-being through work, and by adopting appropriate behaviours to keep well. However, it's not just a shift in political ideology which has led to a reframing of the idea of welfare and the institutions of the welfare state. There are many other reasons, of course, some structural and historical, such as the rise of the women's and anti-racist movements, the evolution of diverse family forms, the dominance of global finance capital over national capitals and national governments, which renders states less able to pursue national welfare spending policies should they even wish to do so. At the same time, service user movements and academics have critiqued the welfare state as something which regulates and disciplines the poor as much as meets their needs. So there are strong political and practical reasons why the welfare state came under attack. Very few today, either from left or right, would advance the philosophical justification for welfare made by Marshall in the 1950s that the welfare state was the guarantor of social citizenship. My point then is not to defend the institutions of the welfare state as they have operated. It is rather to note, on the one hand, in recent years, the idea of welfare has, in the minds of politicians, come to convey idleness, dependency, and a lack of self-sufficiency. Whereas on the other, the idea of well-being has been used to convey the actions which a self-sufficient citizenry can and should take to achieve individual happiness. Well-being becomes associated with individual autonomy and welfare with its opposite, dependency and a lack of in enterprise. The main route to happiness and individual autonomy in these political discourses is often a self-help route witness the phenomenal rise of the self-help well-being industry. This individual responsibility approach is nowhere more apparent than in the advice of the New Economics Foundation to individuals to connect, be active, take notice, keep learning and give. Noble-sounding sentiments for an active citizenry. But as social theorists Claire Edwards and Rob Imrie have pointed out, life satisfaction on this view is related to particular idealised forms of behaviour or ways of being, including being fit, healthy, employed and engaged in civic society, which ignores the significant societal barriers that particular individuals, such as disabled people, experience in participating in society as self-determining individuals. It further stigmatises those that do not meet the well-being ideal. This idea of a well-being ideal and its impact is something I want to return to later. But as sociologist Elizabeth Sointer has pointed out, as a result of this discourse, well-being emerges as a normative obligation to be chosen and sought after by individual agents, i.e. something we must all try to achieve by adopting the correct lifestyle and behaviour. This is associated, she says, with a more general move away from subjects as citizens to subjects as consumers. Both well-being and welfare, then, as political ideas, operate upon individuals to suggest certain desired, or indeed undesired, ways of being and doing, or in our context, ways of being well and doing well. And if you think I'm being critical, listen to Times Higher Education columnist and Essex professor of sociology, Frank Ferrady. Happiness really gets his goat. All talk of happiness and well-being, he argues, is symptomatic of an unjustifiable intrusion of politics into our emotional lives. Should elective governments be in the business of instructing the public about the purpose of life and the meaning of contentment, he asks in a recent blog. Who made the Prime Minister philosopher king? Since when have politicians developed privileged access to moral truths? 
Do we want our children to acquire a love of reading and knowledge of science and of history, or the latest crackpot's take on the secrets of a happy life? Now, I do not share Faraday's view that the emotional cannot be political, quite the opposite, in fact. But I do share his concerns about the rise of some of the most bizarre forms of self-help therapy. We've moved, then, from a situation where one political ideology, a belief, if not the reality, in collective state provision for human need, has given way to another, one where individual well-being is the responsibility and obligation of the individual, and one which is increasingly shaped by consumerism. Those in need who wish to secure their well-being must be ready for work, ready for choice, ready to consume, and now ready to make themselves happy. <laughs> These political ideas do not, of course, operate in an intellectual vacuum. I would suggest we can make sense of them by reference to a wider framework around the idea of responsibility, or as some, as some writers have called it, the growth of responsabilization. I've called this talk, Welfare and Wellbeing in an Age of Responsibility. What do we mean by this? And surely, responsibility is an individual trait to be valued. Well, indeed, it is. Certainly, responsibility for our actions within those contexts over which we have some personal control. But that is not the same as responsibility for the unequal distribution of resources, which makes it very difficult for some to exercise choice within an increasingly marketized set of public services. When David Cameron came to power, he stated immediately on entering office, I want to help try and build a more responsible society here in Britain, one where we don't just ask what are my entitlements, but what are my responsibilities. This has, of course, been a well-worn theme since the rise of neoliberalism 30 years ago, but takes different forms and shapes in different political contexts. Tony Blair, reflecting on his period in office, stated, our contract with the people was about opportunity and responsibility going together. This is what some have called the contractarian view of responsibility. It's based upon the idea that the state's side of the bargain is to provide opportunities, and as the other side of the bargain or contract, citizens take individual responsibility to change their circumstances through their own actions. On this view, the state no longer acts to compensate for the failures of the economic and social system, but instead sets out a contract with its citizens to enable them to change their own circumstances. At its heart, it is based around an ideological belief that the state had become a far too benevolent benefactor, dispensing an economic largesse. It is the responsibility of the poor to seize opportunities to claw their own way out of poverty and so-called dependency. And in the words of David Cameron again, if you fail to take responsibility, then the free ride is over. I would suggest that just as welfare to work without jobs is only half a welfare settlement, this welfare contract is only half a contract, or as is the case with all one-sided contracts, no real contract at all. If the state sets the conditions for claimants, but leaves job creations solely to the private sector, who is it that those out of work are meant to hold responsible or to enforce their contract with? Some writers have suggested that the age of responsibility marks a global shift from the idea of collective to individual, individual responsibility for social problems, a denial of the social causes of poverty, social exclusion or poor well-being. Professor Peter Taylor Gubby at Kent has described this as a transition to a more individual, less solidaristic view of citizenship. In fact, the age of responsibility refers not just to a shift towards the individual, but also a shift of responsibility from states to markets. Rather than directly contracting with citizens, the state increasingly contracts out responsibility to the private sector, and increasingly the voluntary sector. Now, whilst this may provide increased choice, though I suggest this is doubtful, as markets in public services are dominated by a handful of large private companies and national charities. It also disperses the experience of policy amongst a range of organisations that are not politically accountable. And as pointed out by Carmel and Papadopoulos, whose contract is with the state, not with the citizen. 
This is where responsibility begins to merge then with the rhetoric of choice. This running together of individual responsibility and choice certainly has a strong common sense appeal. Individual autonomy and self-reliance are seductive because they appeal to an understanding of ourselves as autonomous individuals, something at the heart of the European liberal tradition ever since the Enlightenment. And choice appeals to our sense of desire for individual control. But as social scientists, we always draw attention to the social relationships within which autonomy and choices take place. These relationships are never neutral. They always involve some form of power, be it economic, political, sexual, cultural, and either facilitate or constrain choice. As Graham Thompson, professor of political economy at the Open University has put it, there is indeed what might be called a coherent, large-scale responsabilization process underway, led by governments and public authorities. This is sometimes referred to as governance of the self in modern societies. Perhaps the most well-known exponent of this latter view is Professor Nicholas Rose at the LSE. In his Powers of Freedom, Reframing Political Thought, he argued that we are increasingly governed through freedom. Freedom, according to Rose, is not the opposite of government, but one of its chief inventions. In this context, I suggest that we are increasingly being offered a model of social and public policy, ostensibly about freedom, choice and individual responsibility, yet which is, of course, another form of governance, one in which responsibility is based less and less on collective and solidaristic values and the public good and public accountability, and more on individual responsibility and self-help consumerism. Those who are to be freed of their so-called dependency on welfare are, to use Nicholas Rose's words, forced to be free, and are offered what he calls compulsory choice. Now, if this all sounds like some Machiavellian conspiracy, then that's not at all what I mean. Indeed, quite the opposite. Ever since Michel Foucault's work on governmentality, social scientists have tried to understand how governance works in everyday situations and relationships, and how it operates without central government direction. To go back to Graham Thompson, the distinguishing element of this approach is that it does not require citizens necessarily to comply with rules and regulations, nor to obey an authority. Rather, it involves an uncoerced application of certain values rooted in the motivation for action. It seems to be fundamentally premised on the construction of a moral being the modern individual that accepts the consequences of its actions in a self-reflexive manner. In other words, we must learn to hold ourselves responsible for our own welfare and well-being and to blame ourselves for any failure to be well or do well. Now trying to understand forms of governance of the self is to my mind an important way of understanding social policy from the perspective of social theory and is partly the approach I followed in some of my earlier work. I believe it can help us understand the way ideas of welfare and well-being act upon and through individuals. I have to admit, though, it is rather different to the traditional approach known as social administration, which for so long dominated the study of social policy. And before I move on, I want to acknowledge the continued importance of that tradition. Professor Julia Twigg, known for her work on social policy in the body, caught the sense of traditional social policy once when she described it as a meat and potatoes kind of subject. It's about who gets what and how. One of the most important things social policy analysts still have to contribute, especially at the moment, is an understanding of how wealth and income are distributed and how public services are organised in society today. In fact, I would say that in the last 50 years, this has never been more important than it is now. Recognising this, the Social Policy Association the professional body for social policy academics, recently brought together leading thinkers to produce a report in defence of welfare as a response to the planned cuts in public spending and their impact on the poor. I just want to show you one simple graph used by Peter Taylor Gooby in his contribution and compiled not by left-leaning academics but by the International Monetary Fund, which says it all, I think. Combining the previous government's March budget the coalition government's June budget and the comprehensive spending review, the IMF calculated that state spending in the UK is on a downward curve steeper than any other European country 
and falls for the first time in history below the level of the United States by 2014 to 15. We start second from the bottom and end up bottom on that graph. Um, if this interpretation is correct, and it's shared by most social policy analysts across the political spectrum, then perhaps you might say those of us concerned with social policy and committed to social justice should indeed be trying to understand how the remaining meat and potatoes are to be divvied out. However, and despite its importance, this is not where I'm trying to take us tonight. Instead of arguing, uh, instead I'm arguing that as well as the distribution of resources, we should also try to understand how the ideas of well-being and welfare and the institutions, structures and mechanisms of the design to deliver them can be forms of governance of the self. So to return to my own work, I once described my approach as putting the social back into policy, and my first example concerns how welfare works on individuals through particular social categories, which are both discursive and material. In early work on citizenship and then later on social identity, I was concerned to show that what are bases of entitlement to welfare for some can be founded on exclusions for others and can have powerful effects on how people experience and shape their personal and social identities. Political ideologies of welfare and well-being have a powerful effect on shaping the social and the individual. Let me take citizenship first. Whereas Marshall saw social citizenship as the guarantor of inclusion, inclusion, as I've already suggested, an analysis of the actual rather than the imagined history of citizenship, and particularly its relationship to immigration legislation, shows it operating as a means of exclusion from claims upon the welfare state. The die was cast by the socially reforming Liberal government of 1906. It introduced some of the first elements of the welfare state, old age pensions and national insurance, it nevertheless tied eligibility to the very strict residency criteria established in the 1905 Aliens Act. This effectively excluded many immigrants at that time, those without 20 years residency and 20 years as a British subject, who were, as Steve Cohen has pointed out, most notably, though not exclusively, migrant Jews. Pressed by jingoistic nationalist forces from the right and by anti-Semitism in many of the leadership of the trade union movement, and increasingly influenced by eugenicist ideas about race and empire, the Liberal government rode a tide of social reform linked to nationalism and racism, which has unfortunately permeated welfare provision from that time on. By the time of the Second World War, this approach was so ingrained that William Beveridge was able to justify his proposed reforms by claiming, in the next 30 years, housewives as mothers have vital work to do in ensuring the continuance of the British race and the British ideals in the world. Perhaps one of the most notable conjunctions of sexism and racism in official policy. <laughs> Subsequent post-war legislation was ambivalent on the issue of race, citizenship and eligibility. Most notably, the National Health Service, created in the Act of 1946, was free to all, irrespective of nationality. Thus, the Nurem Bevan asserted the rights of aliens to make use of the National Health Service. But open access did not last long. Eligibility was first restricted in the 1949 NHS Act. And by 1962 and the Commonwealth Immigrants Act, legislation had been put in place which laid the basis for a whole range of formal and informal exclusions aimed at post-war black and Asian immigrants. This and subsequent legislation removed the right of migrant dependents to recourse to public funds. The no recourse to public funds clause, of course, remains central today in relation to granting visas by the UK Border Agency, for example. Now, my purpose here is not to give in any sense a history of immigration and citizenship or the welfare state, but simply to point out that both practically and ideologically, groups of individuals have been excluded and had their social identities shaped for them, either through legislation as aliens or second or third class citizens, or through informal ideology as scroungers, the undeserving poor, the work shy, non-genuine claimants, etc. That is, by the principles, practices and ideologies associated with state welfare at different periods in history. This is a theme I developed later in subsequent work. I looked at the way social policy can shape identities. In this respect, I was and remain influenced by the work of Fiona Williams, 
who articulated this approach as a concern with the way welfare discourses shape the materiality of people's lives. I suggested that we can think about how this works by, distinct, sorry, by distinguishing between ontological and categorical identity. Put simply, ontological identity ref, ref, is our coherent sense of self or being in the world, and categorical identity refers to the social identity categories we inhabit and which shape our social selves as we live in particular re relationships with others. We can see that users of the welfare state are often seen through negative identity categories of dominant political discourses. One of the more powerful constructions in more recent times has operated around the distinction between the genuine and non-genuine claimant, who is work shy and sponges off the state. Another very contemporary, much used social category of genuineness loved by new labor is hardworking families. For us as individuals, we work up a sense of our coherent ontological identity partly through the categorical identities that are offered up to us within the social relationships through which we live our lives. If these are negative identities shaped by political antagonism to the welfare state, this can have a powerful effect on our sense of self and our personal well-being if we are state welfare service users. The way welfare is organized and thought about then just like other social forms and institutions, bears on us as individuals and helps shape the way we not only live our lives, but the available social categories through which we think about ourselves and live out our identities. The same is true for discourses around well-being and thinking of ourselves as responsible, autonomous individuals who must strive for individual happiness is a means of governance of the self that shifts responsibility for social risks from a collective responsibility to be managed by the state to one to be managed by responsible individuals. This individualization of risk has been, one of the key has been one of the key changes observed by social scientists since the work of Giddens and Beck and may be an important backdrop to the rise of individual anxiety, stress and depression today, increasingly common causes of social and personal ill-being. However, I think we have to consider not only the way we are governed by social forms, but also how we can find positive ways of being within them that allow us to be more expressive and which recognize our subjectivity and perhaps support a de deeper sense of ontological security and personal well-being. Now, as I suggested earlier, well-being cannot adequately be equated with simply with positive emotional states. Ryan and Sapp, two psychologists working within a multidisciplinary approach to well-being, coming out of the University of Bath, suggest well-being concerns a person's capacity for optimal functioning and encompasses not only the issue of physical health, but also a sense of interest in one's surroundings, a confidence in being able to formulate and act to fulfill goals, and the motivation and energy to persist in the face of obstacles. A well-being is able to maintain its vitality and to thrive within its everyday ecological environment. Now this is a much fuller version of well-being which draws on the distinction in the Aristotelian tradition between hedonia and happy or happiness and eudaimonia or self-fulfillment. In fact, this is an approach which is increasingly finding favor in academic social policy. It allows us, as Gough, McGregor and Camfield at Bath have argued, to think about the conditions of a more fully rounded humanity. An aim for social and public policy of positive self-fulfillment then is for me much to be preferred to the simple hedonistic aim of happiness. It allows us to consider what it means to be well alongside what it means to do well. It raises questions of human meaning, personal experience and social recognition as well as access to material goods and resources. It suggests that the purpose of social policy might be the promotion of an ontological security and adds another dimension to the traditional focus on redistribution. However, as implied at the start of this lecture, we need to treat the concept of well-being with great caution and some suspicion, given its near universal advocacy across the political spectrum. Even in the hands of social policy analysts, there is a danger that we get 
carried away with the idea of individual self-fulfillment without paying attention to its potential negative side as a well-being ideal. I also argue that a preoccupation with individual well-being alone has the potential to detract from the continued importance of collective well-being and collective social welfare. The provision of welfare benefits, whilst they can indeed act as forms of governance of the self, also provide the material conditions in which well-being is lived and felt. A different language, I argue, then is required to re-articulate welfare and well-being, which supports collectivist responsibilities yet respects individual autonomy. In my most recent work, I've developed a relational theory of well-being. I argue that well-being should be seen as a process, not simply an outcome like happiness and that it is the product of different types of relationship. As social scientists, we should be concerned to understand which relationships constitute human well-being and how. And we should seek to understand what sorts of actions individuals themselves feel contribute to their well-being, rather than starting with a highly prescriptive account of responsible behaviours that I've already called a well-being ideal. Nor should we assume, though, that the pursuit of eudaimonic well-being, complete self-fulfillment, as Ryan and Sapp suggest, is the only legitimate aim for social policy. I also suggest that we should seek to understand how individuals can, a sense, uh, can achieve a sense of being well enough, especially as their circumstances and relationships change over time. This is particularly relevant, for example, in relation to the life course and ageing. Recent research with age concern by Marianne Barnes and Lizzie Ward in the School of Applied Social Sciences has investigated how older people themselves define their own well-being and what their aspirations are. In a recent paper drawing on this research, we have pointed out how so much contemporary government policy on ageing and well-being can be located within the framework of neoliberal governmentality and consumerism. This has been a long-term trend across successive governments. And one example, Opportunity Age, from the Department of Work and Pensions in 2005, illustrates this well, I think. In developing modern public services for older people, our overarching objective is to promote well-being and independence. We want to achieve a society where older people are active consumers of public services and exercise control and choice, not passive recipients. And whilst Barnes and Ward's respondents do indeed value independence and control, they equally value what we have called the positive dependence that comes from knowing they can rely on others for their care and support. This can be close relations and friends, but it can equally be the more distant relationships they have with professionals who provided much needed health and welfare services, or indeed who provide commercial services and who recognise and accept them and deal with them with dignity and respect in all transactions on a day-to-day -day basis. We also argue that we should consider well-being and old age not only in terms of which relationships contribute to older people's well-being, but also how older people themselves might be a resource for the well-being of younger people. That is, we need to consider the reciprocal nature of processes through which well-being may be generated. As we argue, if well-being is to be a useful concept for policy and practice relating to older people, then we need to understand what it means for those whose horizons may be becoming more limited, especially the very old, whose timescales may be shorter than other adults and who may see little point in looking forward or who are experiencing illnesses associated with growing older and thus need to find ways of being well while they are unwell. This is not to argue an inevitable association between old age, poor health and reduced circumstances, but to highlight particular features of the experience of ageing that challenges normative constructions, especially of active ageing, which assume a particular type of person. From a government policy perspective, it appears that well-being in old age is generated by being independent and having choice. Predictably, this suits policy objectives and ideological imperatives to shift responsibility to the individual and facilitate consumer choice and market-oriented service delivery. But care occupied a significant place in the narratives of many of those interviewed by Barnes and Ward, 
One example illustrates how the presence or absence of care within a helping relationship can make a substantial difference to experiences of well-being. A 97-year-old woman, living alone and with very limited mobility, spoke of her need to be taken by car if she was to do her own shopping. She contrasted the way in which this help was provided by her son, who offered a very functional service, with her experience of being taken shopping by a friend's son. She said, he treats me, I feel just like the Queen. You know, he says, don't you dare open that car, I'll do that. Opens the car, gets the, I say, darling, I can put my seatbelt on, I'm not helpless. And he says, you'll do as you're told when you're out with me. And he treats me, it's just wonderful, he's such a darling. Now, some would suggest that the way this man treats her denies her autonomy, leaves her out of control. Elsewhere in her interview, she demonstrated a fierce independence. But in this context, where going shopping is about the only time she gets out of her flat, her friend's treatment of her transforms a functional activity into an experience of being cared for and made to feel special. We suggest that this may be an example of the positive dependency that contributes to rather than detracts from welfare. So, to sum up. Well-being is about far more than happiness. It is about the quality of private relationships we have with those close to us, but also with more distant others. It can be about self-fulfillment rather than happiness, but we must remember that for many people, being well enough is a legitimate and appropriate aim. Perhaps most of all, well-being is dependent upon a sense of security, which for many necessitates the use of services provided by the welfare state. Welfare is not the enemy, but often the precondition of well-being. As I suggested at the start of this lecture, introducing policies whose outcome is greater inequality will not lead to improved well-being. Attempts to slash the welfare state will not make us happier. However, we also need to be aware that welfare services and well-being strategies must be based not on a centrally given set of ideal behaviours or expectations, but on the voices and needs of those who use services. Public policy for welfare and well-being needs to understand that individuals cannot be made responsible for all the broader socio-economic conditions that they encounter. Yes, we all want to feel a sense of autonomy and personal control, but we need to recognise that this depends not on some crude notion of independence, but a recognition that our sense of self is the product not only of individual actions, but of the social and personal relationships we enjoy and the identity categories deployed in political discourse. I believe it remains one of the responsibilities of states to create the circumstances in which both individual and collective well-being can be achieved. There is also a responsibility, though, to base policy on the needs of those who use services and to avoid the negative stereotypes found in much contemporary political ideology. And finally, whilst I've been critical of responsabilization, I do nevertheless take responsibility for my own personal and professorial well-being. And I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that I no longer drink whiskey or travel on the roofs of trains. <laughs> Thank you. congratulate you, David, on that absolutely superb presentation. Um, it was so thought-provoking, and I have a background in health visiting, as you know, and it certainly made me reflect and rang many bells of health visiting in the northeast of England, and the inevitable 
sense of failure that many people were almost set up to fail because of the policies and, and so on and the inequalities. Um, and I was particularly struck by your argument about the politicization of responsibility. And I probably rang lots of bells with all of your audience here, because even if you're not working personally and individually with people in very difficult circumstances, we all read the newspapers, we all listen to the news, and it's an extremely worrying situation. However, I'm very pleased that you do take responsibility for your own happiness and well-being. Um, and, uh, and I loved your initial story about the uh, travelling on the roof of the train. So, many congratulations. I have here a scroll. 